Two questions about the eustachian tube dilation. First question, do you CT your patients? No, I don't CT the patient. Um, when the device was implemented or was on the market in Germany, it was mandatory in 2011 to CT every patient because you had the fear of injuring the internal carotid artery. Up to now, there is not a single report of this, um, con uh, of this uh, possibility because with the length of the device, we're just dealing with the cartilaginous part and not with the bony part. So I'm not CTing patients anymore. And also, it's not recommended anymore in... Uh, in not recommended in yeah. the manual. No. And pediatric are cleared for EU, uh, eustachian tube dilation? They are not cleared for an, uh, with the Intellis device yet because there's not much yeah. data at the moment, no. Right. My second question is technical. Do you enter with the endoscope and the Entelos device from the same nostril or different nostril? Whatever you want. I've done through both nostrils, through one nostril, I've used a zero, 30, 70 degree. I've even done one case where I had to go transorally with the device. This is up to the anatomy. And I mean, we see patients with significant septal deviations, for example. Sometimes you have to treat the septum to reach this area. Um, I do sometimes out fracturings for the inferior turbinates, a lot of good eye congestion just to reduce the swelling and then normally it's not a problem. Thank you. And, and just, just to add, I do a lot of these um, dilations under local. I don't know if how most of them are being done here, but it's very well tolerated, very comfortable with a good sphenopalatine block. So they can be, right. Yeah, my question was, uh, if you do the dilatation of the balloon, the, the Eustachian tube, in most of the patients locally or generally? Um, I've done many both ways. In, in the U.S. right now, um, the, the main uh, payment is with what we call a C code, which pays the facility. So it would be a, a hospital or a, an ambulatory surgery center. Um, so if, if we did it in, the, in an ambulatory um, outpatient non-surgical site setting, such as what we call the office, um, there's no facility fee. And so a lot of uh, the insurers are not reimbursing at a high rate enough to cover the cost of the device. If we do it in a facility such as an ambul ambulatory surgery center or an OR, then the device cost is covered with the C code. So because of that, we're doing the majority in those, those facilities. But some patients that are having sinus treatment um, concomitantly, which we're seeing a high incidence of that, um, because of the utility of the Intellis device, I can treat them in, in an ambulatory setting because I'm treating their sinuses and then and treat their eustachian tube at the same time. Comment, <clears throat> comment to Peter and Andrews. You don't have to be afraid of the middle medial synechia after ballooning. So it's, it's not necessary to use any, any tampons there, unless you do maybe polyp removal. And to our, our colleague from Augusta, uh, <clears throat> etmoidectomy is, is not necessary. Only polyp removal is sufficient. Ethmoidectomies in general are not necessary? Yes. Okay, we can debate that probably another, <laughs> another session. Can, can I just make a point? I agree, I, I agree what you're saying, um, but I'm putting the, the dissolvable packing in for two reasons. One reason is to prevent uh, lateralization or adhesions, but the other is to deliver steroid. What local anesthetic do you actually use for balloon dilatation? So for me, I, I listen to people with a lot of experience, such as Andy and Florian, but for me, I will initially spray the nose. Um, we use things like cofenolcaine. Uh, I'll wait 20 minutes, allow that to work, and then I will do that on the ward, generally. The patient then comes down to the anesthetic room, and I'll then place in pledgets with anesthetic and adrenaline into the middle meatus, into the lateral sidewall, um, and wait probably 20 minutes. So ideally you want a, f a few patients to make this work. And then I inject with 2% xylocaine, 1 in 80,000 adrenaline. And uh, by then the nose is numb and once the injection goes in, it's very numb, 
and it, it's something I highly recommend. I think as ENT surgeons, we all enjoy doing local anaesthetic procedures. What do you inject, sorry? It depends. For me, I inject the root of the middle terminate, the middle terminate itself. I also inject the septum. People talk about the sphenopalatine ganglion block. You can inject, inject just behind this area. Um, and, you know, certainly in my experience, it works very well. But it's, it's, a, it's a gradual... Uh, Dr. Florian, what's your experience with post-radiotherapy balloons, I mean, eustachian tube balloons? There is so far, I have no experience. I've done one case. Um, I know that especially the Chinese uh, um, are very, very interested uh, to do this. And we are at the moment starting with a colleague, a little study here, or the first study um, to have a look at these patients, yeah. Because it's a scar, yeah. And wherever you have a scar, I mean, if you have an esophageal scar, a scar you use a balloon, yeah. So why not uh, try it? And I think the... The, the, the study was not possible um, prior to Entellus having the CE mark for the dilatation because with the other devices, the little guide wire that you have to insert into the tube is very flimsy. And I, I, if you have a proper scar, I'm, I doubt it if you can get through this um, device with the with other device. I just wondered about uh, to make this uh, uh, dilation of, of the eustachian tube only, not the other sinuses. Uh, what about um, decongestion of the nose? Again? Is it, like do I have, would you recommend uh, to put some decongestion into the nose? Oh yeah, I mean, if I do it on a local? Yeah. yeah. Um, the painful part is not the dilatation of the tube. The painful part is the inserting uh, the endoscope and the device through the nose, through the nasal cavity. And you don't want to create bleeding while going. So I'll do a massive amount of decongestion. I do local um, anesthetics, the same as Peter's doing. I also do the infraorbital nerve block because I think it's uh, for the anterior part of the nose very good to numb everything. Yeah. Okay, yeah. but I'm sh quite sure about myself. I'm going to do this under general anesthesia when I start doing... Uh, I'm used to use balloons in yeah. the sinuses, but now I'm going to start with the station tube. Yeah. And then I was wondering, uh, I, do I actually need to put any anesthesia into the nose if the patient is under general anesthesia? Well, I... Is there a, a clue about that? This is just my personal approach. It's very important that the patient has no bleeding, no hematoma, and no pain post-surgery. The anesthesiology, the GA that wears off after the surgery. So I have to make sure that I've got a long-lasting effect. This is why I do the infraorbital nerve block with a long-lasting... Um, uh, I use bubivacaine at the end of the surgery, and I also place a couple of dots in the nose or in the inferior turbinate just to make sure that everything is quite numb. There. You would do that even, even though you had a general anesthesia? Yes, I do this for my septoplasties, for my rhinoplasties, for everyone. They get a block afterwards. So just as a, a, an, a, an alternative, I think the decongestant is important um, to, to reduce bleeding, um, and it also gives you more room to maneuver. Uh, in the nose, um, but under general, I don't do any anesthesia whatsoever, any, uh, any local injections whatsoever, and I've had zero complaints of post-op pain or discomfort. Uh, a little question uh, to Dr. Bast. Do you get patchulous stake tubes at all? Same question was asked this morning, this morning also in the, in the other ET session. Um, as far as I know, there's one um, reported case to cause a patchless tube. The problem is, has the patient had a patchless tube already prior to the surgery, yes or no, because the, the assessment is quite difficult. Um, the worry that was, in, uh, especially back in Germany, when everything was started, is do we get stenosis yeah, uh, after uh, putting a balloon into the ostachian tube? And there also for the stenosis, there's not a single reported case. And to Dr. Wells, uh, if I got it right, you said you're treating 90% of your CRS patients with balloons as a first step. Mm -hmm. uh, Non-responders uh, to medical treatment, you said. Uh, I got a bit confused on that because we know that balloon by definition is a tool for obstruction. And we know on the other hand that CRS is a disease of the mucosa and not a disease caused by obstruction. 
So what's the uh, uh, rationale behind this sort of approach? Well, I, I think the, the pathophysiology of, of sinusitis is both an obstructive phenomenon and an inflammatory issue of the outflow tract and of the mucosa of the sinus. So what we're finding is that whether you're talking about FES or whether you're talking about balloon dilation, we're creating access to the sinus for topicals. Not, not every patient needs a topical to, to heal up well. Um, and just by dilating their sinus, their, their CRS symptoms resolve or their recurrent acute symptoms resolve. So it's very effective in those patients and depending on the degree of inflammation that we find in the sinus, then at the time of their treatment, I ha I've already had compounded um, irrigations that, are, that have um, mometasone and an antibi antibiotic in it so that I can irrigate and then if I feel like they need to have um, something more long-lasting in their sinus, I use uh, pleuronic gel, which is a, a substance that's, that's, that's um, more liquid at cooler temperatures, very easy to, to put through a syringe, but once it's in the body and warms up, it gets very thick and viscous. And our compounding pharmacist for $70 can put antibiotic and steroids in there for me and I get four syringes, 10 ml syringes, and I put, usually use one to two at the, at the procedure, and then I have them come back um, every week or two afterwards, and I can flush them out and put it back in again. And with that technique, we're able, we're addressing the inflammation that I agree is incredibly important, um, and we're able to, to resolve a lot of patients that have significant um, inflammation as, as part of their, their disease burden. And can I ask about your um, improvement rates using the all validated questionnaire? Um, are you finding that most of your patients are now in sort of single figures or are they having a significant reduction? What would you sort of say would be a significant success rate? For me? Well, it all depends where they start. Yeah, um, I mean, this patient that I've just shown, it's a, I mean, this is a, the, the best scenario, the best outcome. Um, but normally I try, and like, if they have proper symptoms, for me, they score at least a medium um, moderate rate. And if I can get um, every um, question, every of the seven questions, at least two points down, then I'm, uh, at an, as an average, then it's a good outcome. In com I mean, we know that the diagnostic is not, totally possible, yeah, so in combination with their symptoms, especially when being under pressure conditions. Uh, Pia Larsen from Denmark. I had, have had one uh, patulous uh, staking tube after two months, but then I waited two more months and then it went normal. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, do you always do the, the, the sinuses and the, the eustachian tube in one procedure. Uh, normally I would uh, straighten the septum and then wait and see if the eustachian tube still is, uh, <laughs> if you st still have some under pressure. Oh, definitely. I'm not doing them in, uh, in most of the cases in one go. They all get a treatment first. And for, uh, also if they, have, see. if they have the sinus disease with polyps, etc., uh, th this has to be treated first before you do anything to the tube. Yeah. So just to, to uh, make a comment about that, I asked the patient what they would like to do. Now there's a chance these symptoms could clear up after I treat your sinuses, but there's a, there's a certain amount of chance that they won't. Do you want to come back and do it again? And they say, and I tell them this is what we do. These are the risks, very low, but these, um, and, and what would you like to do? And they said, please take care of it at one treatment. And so that's what we'll do the vast majority of the time. I, I use the um, six by twenty in adults and children. Six millimeter balloon. In children as well. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question for Dr. Bast. Um, I have a patient um, on the waiting list who's got who's been diagnosed with bilateral TMJ dysfunction, 
And you mentioned that's one of the contraindications. The patient also has symptoms of eustachian tube dysfunction. It was actually exacerbated by grommets put in in another hospital. So I was wondering what the reason was for the contraindication of bilateral TMJ dysfunction. It's not a contraindication. You just have to have a look at the TMJ because sometimes when you, when you see the occlusion, the occlusion plane is not right, they have clicking, etc. It's worse to see a, to have a look, to cooperate with a MaxFax surgeon as well. It's not an exclusion criteria, but these uh, TMJ problem can uh, act like a tube dysfunction problem as well. Yeah. They could have coexistence. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, one more question. Yeah. Just, you, you mentioned you would never uh, treat a patient with um, uh, disease in the middle air. And then I was thinking physiologically, why wouldn't a retraction pocket improve? Well, there is no, da <laughs> there is no data. There is no data on it. There is, um, and this is an ontology problem, yeah, and um, uh, we've seen it, there's no data for retraction pockets, there's no data for cholesteatoma, yeah, there's no data for the surgical outcome. For sure, these investigations have to be done, but they have, have not been done yet. It's quite interesting to think that it oh, yeah. might be are, help. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're allowed to think. Okay. Definitely. Yeah. Hope. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think uh, we'll, we'll close it there. Thank you very much for coming.